God is good. And all the time. Amen. Amen. So good morning, church. Wonderful Lord's Day. Oh. Brother Derek, why are you making me cry a while ago? <laughs> Um, well, first of all, I want to thank the Lord for this opportunity to be with you again. And um, I know Brother uh, Calvin Cooper is uh, joining us today uh, via Zoom. And I uh, just want to say thank you, Brother Calvin, for your service to the Lord, for being our uh, one of the elders in this congregation. Thank you. Mwa mwa. Chup chup. Brother Calvin. Coop. All right. So, um, again, good morning. So last week, we uh, talked about, we started talking about the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. And we talked about the lesson um, that we got from the younger son who happens to be the prodigal son. So this morning, we will continue on with uh, um, lesson number two about the prodigal son. And uh, <clears throat> we will be talking about the loving father, right? So um, the prodigal son, or some says it's the parable of the forgiving father, or some it is the parable of the, uh, the loving father. But whatever you call it, you can find it in Luke chapter 15. Okay, so um, let's start the scene in verse 20. In Luke chapter 15, verse 20, it says, So he got up and went to his father, but while he was still in the distance, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. So the prodigal son went to his father. Uh, he actually had a ready speech for his father. And then the father saw him from a distance, and the father ran to him um, from where he was. Now, right off the bat, one lesson that uh, we all throw out when we read this parable of the loving father is that the love of the father, right? Now, without a doubt, it really speaks of the love of the father. And, uh, but this morning, I want to go deeper. I know you have read probably many times and you have heard many times this parable. But this morning, I don't know if some of you uh, already heard what I'm, about, what I'm about to say to you. But again, let us dig deeper uh, and to see what's underneath this parable. And uh, first thing that I would like to say is that just like in any country, at any given point in time, there are traditions that are being observed. All right? Wherever you go, different cultures, different countries, there are different uh, traditions based on their values, based on their sentiments. All right? So the Jewish culture during Jesus' time was no exception. And there were a lot of traditions during his time. And we, we would see some of the traditions in this parable. And that's where we will go uh, dig deeper. Now, first and foremost, I would like to call your attention to this word, kesaza. I don't know if you heard this word, kesaza. It's a Hebrew uh, term. It's actually a ceremony, all right? So kesaza, it is a severing of connection. To sever a connection, cutting off, according to encyclopedia.com. It is a technical term used in the Talmud for a ceremony or ceremony that tells the Jewish people to cut off sons and daughters 
that sell, that sell heirlooms to Gentiles. Now, in this case, the squandering of the son's uh, inheritance, all right? Or a son marries a woman below their status. So the community would break a clay pot in front of the offender and turn their back on them, causing the offender uh, to have to leave the town or city and live anywhere else they could. So, Kazaza, it is a ceremony. Okay. So, um, we've seen right there the, the offense, uh, what the offense be, so that there would be a Kazaza ceremony. Now, let me go to the first scenario. Okay. So, in the parable, we learn that the father ran towards his son. When the father saw him from the distance and the son is actually not in the town yet he was on his way to the town to the village but when the father saw him when 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 the word distance it means he was really far so when the father saw him from afar the father ran towards the son now I ask myself, why did the father run towards the son? Well, I know most of us would say, well, brother Mike, because the father was so excited, you know, to see his son coming back. All right. So the father was really excited to see him and couldn't wait to place his arms around him. Well, I would say, you're right. I would do the same. All right. So last year when I went home, when I saw my family, you know, I was really excited to put my arms around them. All right. If I had to run, I would run. Of course. You know, so that would be the normal reaction. So the father run. All right. But, you know, there's more to it than his excitement. And it has something to do with the kezaza. All right. So part of the tradition is what they call the Kazaza's ceremony. And I do believe that the father knows about it. And he ran to his son from a distance with his excitement and probably with the Kazaza ceremony at the back of his head. Now, I also ask myself, why not the son run to the father? Or why not the father just wait for his son from where he was standing okay, until his son you know, arrived? Why did he have to go and run towards the son? And the word run is not just your typical running. According to the Bible, he was racing to the son, okay, to his son. Okay, so what's behind the reason for the father went running after his son. Okay. Now, let us go back again to the word. Oops, sorry. Kezaza. Okay. Now, I would believe that another reason why the father raises toward his son is to protect his son okay, from the rejection of the community. All right, because when the community gets to his son first, then they will have to perform this. They would broke a clay pot and they would turn their backs on to the son and it will humiliate the son. And worse, they would probably beat the son. All right, and the father cannot do anything about it. So that's why the father raises to the son so that the, the community won't be able to do the Kazaza ceremony. So the father was running against this Kazaza ceremony. All right. So this causes the offender to have lived the town <clears throat> or the city and live anywhere else that he can. And this could have been a very shameful and uh, painful experience, not only for the son, but of course to the father. Seeing your son 
being rejected by your own people, seeing your son probably beaten by your neighbors, by the community where you live. So it was both humiliating and very shameful and painful for both the father and the son. And, you know, um, we know what the son went through before coming back to his senses, before coming back to his father. So it would be very tough on the son. Again, coming from uh, far away, lost everything, and going back to be rejected. That would be really hard for the son and really hard for the father. So that's why the father raises to the son so that he could get first to his son, not the community. All right. Now, by getting to his son first, there would be no kezaza ceremony because the father forgives his son. And that means that the community would have to accept the father's forgiveness to his son. So the father was racing against this kezaza ceremony. Now, the next scenario, the scripture tells us that the father embraced and kissed his son. Okay? It was a sign of the father's forgiveness and it was a sign of the father's acceptance. Okay? So the father didn't mind if his son hadn't taken a bath for a week or so. Or his son smells like a pig's pen. You know. And we learn that his son uh, was eating a pig pod. So the father didn't care about all those things. So probably it was a, a, a sweet aroma to him. The smell of his stinking son. <laughs> the smell of the, 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 the pig pen. Okay. You know, if you ever raise a pig, when we were young, we have, my father raised a pigs, and we have a couple of pigs. The pig itself, it doesn't really stink, the pig. But the manure, that's the problem. And when you get a lot of them, so the pig would smell. But the pig itself, per se, it has really no smell. I was embracing our pig when I was young. I was uh, bathing our pig, scrubbing him. So the father doesn't care. For him, it was a sweet aroma. So he embraced and he kissed uh, his son. Okay. So the kiss and embrace was uh, a sign first to his son that he was forgiven and that he was welcomed back by his father. And second, the kiss and embrace was a sign for the community to know that they don't have to do this kezaza ceremony. Because the father had forgiven his son. And the father uh, was taking on the son's full shame upon himself. Okay. I would take all the blame. I would take all the shame on my shoulder. Okay, and I will take you home. Okay. You're forgiven. Okay. So now, now with all these things, in the parable, we can surely say that the parable of the loving father, it is the, the act of forgiveness by the father and his love undenying or uh, um, so this uh, the undeserved love of, uh, to his son. So it was the act of forgiveness and only through the, the father's love, through his forgiveness, that this prodigal son can restore his full sonship to the family. So without the father's forgiveness, whatever the son does, he could never restore his full sonship in the family. So only through the act of the father, the act of the forgiveness and the act of the love of the father could only restore 
this son's full sonship in the family. And remember, in his speech, the, the already made speech by the son, he just wanted to be like a servant, just to be a servant of his father, right? But his father said, no, no. I will restore your full sonship. You see? Now, another part of the customs and the traditions of, uh, of the time of Jesus Christ, during the time, has something to do with the way they dress, with their clothing. Now, let us take a look <clears throat> at the typical dress, what the typical dress looks like. So the traditional clothes, there you go, and the other one. So you could probably see the difference. Okay. This was more of the common people, and this would be to more of the elite. Right. Now, as we can see, Men and women, they wore a long dress, touching the, their the hem, almost or really touching the ground. Okay. If not, <clears throat> the, the dress would not uh, uh, um, show their legs. The reason for that is because even for men, it was a shameful thing to do to show your legs during that time. So that's why, that's how the way they dress. So it's a long dress, all right, long dress, okay, touching the hem, touching the ground, or just below the legs, because it's shameful for them, even for men, to show your legs, okay. Now, <clears throat> in general, running for men, as in running, is also shameful. Men, usually they don't run, and even for women. The only, the only person that you could see running would probably be the children playing. But for an adult man, especially those having a, uh, a high position in the society, they don't run. It was a shameful thing to do. Because when you run, people, would, people might interpret that as if you've done something wrong. That's why you are running. So that's why it's shameful for men even to run. Now, imagine yourself wearing this long dress. All right? Imagine yourself wearing that long dress okay, and you will sprint toward your son from a distance. What do you think you would do so that you can run properly, not in an awkward way, to go to your son? What would you do? You would probably do like this, right? You're going to raise your clothes up high, so up, you don't even care, just to go to your son, right? Now, if I will, if I am wearing this coat and if I'm wearing this shirt and if it gets in the way I would probably remove this I would probably remove my trousers and run with my shorts on just to get to my son as fast as I could right so imagine the father imagine the father running towards his son with the long dress now, just like you said, he probably would raise up his dress so that he could run as fast as he could to get to his son. And so that he would not, his dress won't trip him over, right? Now, number one, it was a shameful thing to do for a father, for a man to run. And for a man like him with this stature, it's a shameful thing to do. Second, for him to pull up his tunic, his dress, showing his uh, legs in the process, shameful thing to do. 
So he broke most of the traditions. All right? Now, so the father ran towards his son, and just like you and I would do, okay, we would pull up our dress, our clothes, we don't care how high, as long as you and I can get to our son as quickly as possible. So by pulling the dress, we put ourselves to shame. And the father put himself to shame by running and by showing his legs. Because during those times, a man should walk with his dignity. And that's why it was a shameful thing to do for them to run. Okay. But the father, again, doesn't care. So what? If I run, so what? If I have shown my legs, as long as I could get to where my son is. He could have probably removed his dress, for all I know, just to get to where his son was. Now, with all these things in perspective, we can clearly see, my dear brethren and friends, that one of the lessons indeed about the loving father is clearly manifested in this parable is how great or how deep is the father's love for his son. Amen. Amen. Now, first lesson. Biblical truths are superior to the traditions of men. Okay, now, sometimes when we hear the word traditions, we have these negative thoughts, all right? We have these negative thoughts. Now, because of what is predominantly uh, written in, in the Bible about traditions, and in the Philippines, we have so many traditions, so many. Uh, they say that uh, you don't, you you, you shouldn't. Uh, uh, call this cross the street when there's a cat, a black cat. I don't know if you have that here, and you should not sweep the floor when it is night, night time. Or what else? We, we have so many traditions. Okay? But traditions by itself, it's not actually wrong. Because in the Bible, there is a tradition that's actually good. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. Clearly, the tradition that Paul was referring here was uh, not the kind of tradition that we know of that contradicts the Bible that originated from men, passed down from generations to generation, and has no sound, uh, no sound scriptural, no, no scriptural basis whatsoever, or no truth in them. Okay? So Paul was talking about the gospel that comes from God, delivered to Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ passed on to the apostles, to other believers, and these apostles and the believers pass on to other believers until we have the gospel. So that's what Paul was talking about when he referred to the traditions in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15. Now, the bad traditions are those created by man, passed down to generations. Again, they have no, have no scriptural basis, no truth. That seeks to replace the scripture. One particular tradition uh, was in Matthew chapter 15, 1 and 2. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. You know, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were putting the traditions upon the apostles as if they were authoritative. And one could be guilty of sin if they violate the so-called traditions. All right? Now, here's the reply of Jesus. And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. Now, Jesus got back on them and told them they were the ones who were breaking 
not the traditions, but the commands of God. For the sake of what? For the sake of their traditions. The command of God said, honor your father and your mother. But these hypocrites, they had found a way actually to nullify these commands of God for the sake of their tradition. Now, point being, my dear brethren and friends, these people, they tried to promote traditions more than the commands of God. They tried to elevate traditions above. If this is the scripture, the commands of God, they tried to elevate the traditions above the scripture and make them authoritative. And that's what Jesus was trying to point it out to them. So when the father in the parable ran towards his son, he breaks the tradition. For what? For love. Forgiveness. Because in it, there is no law. Amen. Now, the father saw in the parable that love covers all or covers multitudes of sins. So he was willing to break their traditions. Now the, fa the, the father in the parable, he would dare break the traditions okay, to fulfill the very essence of God, the very character of God, and that is love. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, and above all things, have fervent uh, love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. The father doesn't mind if he had broken so much traditions. If his son stinks and tastes like, you know, pig pod, when he kisses him, he doesn't care. All he cared was to forgive and to love his son. He did it for love and what guess what god is love so no, no no matter how dirty we are and how covered we are with so much mud when we come to god with a clean heart god is ready to welcome you he is ready to welcome us embrace us and kiss us despite of how filthy we are and that is god's love hallelujah amen now let me just go back to this verse for a while many people would quote this first peter 4 8 and they will say right off the bat love will cover a multitude of sins and that is right but we are forgetting one important word and i want to make mention of that one important word is the word fervent. In other translations, continue. Okay. In, in, if you would look at the dictionary, okay. fervent uh, means intense. There's an intensity of love. Okay. But the Greek word puts the word continue or constant. When Peter said these words, he was talking about living a godly life. And he was also talking about how the end would soon come to an end. So he was talking about that. Then he said this word, and above all things, have fervent love. He was telling his audience to continue to show a deep love for each other. Remember that in love, there is, when you, forg when you love somebody, there is always forgiveness as if they all they always come together they go together when you love somebody you have to forgive they come together okay just like what the parable is teaching us you know god loves us so much that he constantly forgave us when we come to him and therefore we must do the same there must be a continue continuity or a constant forgiveness. If somebody hurt you and he came to you and asked for forgiveness, the Lord said, and above all things, have fervent love.
continue to love that person. And when you love that person, you have to forgive that person because love will cover a multitude of sins. And, you know, 1 Peter 4, 8, written by Apostle, uh, Apostle Peter, the same apostle who asked Jesus, and we, we were having this discussion a while ago, the same apostle who asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive somebody? And Jesus said 70 times seven. And probably Peter learned from the greatest teacher of all, unlimited forgiveness. So that's why he wrote, for love cover a multitude of sins and therefore we must continue love one another. And in that love, underneath that love is forgiveness. So therefore, we never stop forgiving and loving one another. All right. Now, Peter clearly uh, learned from the master himself. Our third lesson, Jesus bore our shame. Just like the father in the parable who took it upon himself, the shame that should have fallen to his son, our heavenly father not only forgives us, but takes our shame through his son, Jesus Christ, who was nailed to the cross so that you and I would not suffer the consequence of our actions and the shame and the humiliation that should befall upon us, Jesus took it upon himself and nailed those things on the cross so that we won't experience such a thing. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that a good news? Amen. Amen. Now, when Jesus died on the cross, this has given us the so-called spirit of reconciliation. You know, our broken relationship with God is restored so we might live a righteous life. And this also gives us the hope of everlasting life. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy, when Jesus Christ died, there was joy in his heart. Can you imagine being crucified? Can you imagine being beaten by those Roman soldiers and still you have that joy in your heart? Jesus did that for you and I. For the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God so that you and I could live a righteous life. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. He bore our sins so that we could, so that our sonship could be restored. In the parable, the, the, the father restored his relationship with his son by embracing, by kissing, by putting on the best robe, by putting on a ring, and by making a feast to this prodigal son. Now again, only the father could restore the full sonship of his son to the family. Whatever this prodigal son did, or whatever he would do, he cannot do anything to restore his sonship without the doing of the father. Now in our case, there's nothing that you and I can do to restore our relationship with God without God's doing without Jesus Christ dying on the cross for whatever you do, whatever I do, without coming to Jesus and without Jesus dying on the cross, I could never live a righteous life. So God did everything for us through his son, Jesus Christ. And in John 3, 16, a beautiful, a beautiful verse in itself tells us of this great love of God to all of us through his only son, Jesus Christ. And only through the doing of God through his son, Jesus Christ, by dying on the cross, can we really have a real 
restoration of our relationship with God. And as our relationship was restored, guess what? All the benefits also were restored. Amen. Romans 8, 17, And if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with Him, so that we may also be glorified with Him. One way or another, probably we may have run away from God. But there is no fear in love. If we are genuine in, in our repentance, if our love is genuine for God, we don't have to fear the Lord. Anytime we can come to Him and ask for His forgiveness and He will just put His arms around us, embrace us, and kiss us. We should not fear God. For God is love. We should fear God if we continue to be stubborn, we must fear the Lord. If our heart continues to be stubborn in front of Him, you know, we can safely return to God and wholeheartedly ask for His forgiveness. Finally, the goodness of God. You know, the Father in the parable put on the best robe, a sign of dignity and honor proof of the prodigal's acceptance back into the family. He put on a ring, a sign of authority and sonship. He put on the sandal, a sandal for the son, a sign of master or lordship over his father's servant. And he put on a fist, which only reserved for a special occasion. And this was a rare occasion. Now for some, they would have treated their son according to, to what the son did. They, they, they could have punished their son. Okay? But the father in the parable, you know, he could have also rejected his son from their community for what he did, but he didn't. The father didn't deal with his son's uh, um, misdeeds. But otherwise, in Psalm 103, says it all. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. See, now very interesting in verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions. Now, I, I made mention about this in one of our, uh, during one of our Bible studies on Wednesday. And I just want to briefly share this with you. So, east from the west. Now, why not north? From the south why did God use as far as the east is from the west why not north is from the south now, it seems like a riddle it's just like it seems like a mystery you know, it seems like it's hard to imagine what God is telling us but well if you know the answer it's really not that hard if you know the answer but why not north okay, from the south? Now, north, there is a north pole and there is a south pole, right? But there is no east pole and west pole. North pole and south pole, they are a, a definable points. But there is no east pole and west pole. Now, if I, may if I may illustrate, if this is the Earth, okay, so the North Pole is here. They say that the North Pole is in uh, Antarctica, and uh, uh, and 
sorry, North Pole, uh, we are in Antarctica, and the South Pole is here in the Arctic Ocean. So when you walk, when you walk in a straight line, okay, going from north, going down, there would come a time that you will arrive at the south. And then when you arrive at the south, when you move your foot forward, you are going now to the south. Okay. So from the north, go walking to the north, when you arrive at the south, and when you step out of the south, you are going towards the south. But not with east and the west. When you're walking towards the east, you're always walking towards the east. When you're walking towards the west, you're always walking towards the west. Now don't ask me why. I don't know the answer. But it is what it is. <laughs> That's why there is no west pole and there is no east pole. And that is why north pole and south pole are definable uh, points. Okay. So again, when you walk from the north, going to the south, and when you continue walking, you'll be walking from south to north. But when you walk towards the east, you'll always walk towards the east. You will never meet the west. And when you walk towards the west, you're always walking towards the west, and you'll never meet the east. So that's why when God said okay, to say that God separates our sins as far as the east is from the west, it speaks of the absolute irrevocable measure by which God forgives us. And that's the reason why God mentioned as far as the east is from the west. So now you can see the wisdom of God. Amen? All right. Now last week I asked you if you need something that you don't have to survive. Is there anything that you need that you don't have to survive? And our answer is none. None. We have everything that we need. Now, to top it all up, in the parable, the father threw in a fist. The father, God, threw in a fist for us. He provided everything for us. He had forgiven our sins as far as from the east is from the west. He had given you everything and now he's throwing a fist for us. Instead of condemning us for what we did, God said, it is time for rejoicing for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. Amen. And that's why Jesus came here. It was, it, was, it was not for those claiming to be righteous, but for those who feel marginalized, meaning hopeless, because they are sinful. Those who needed saving, those who needed forgiving, those who needed loving, Jesus came for you. But if you claim that you are righteous, Jesus is not for you. He came to seek and save those which are lost. That's why Jesus came for you and I, because we needed forgiving. We needed loving because we are sinful. You know, God's forgiveness I would say it will be eternal. We come to him, he will forgive you. And he, could, he continued to seek us. And he continued to lavish us with everything, provides us with so much provisions in our lives. And it only amounts to God's immeasurable love for all of us. And I think that deserves an amen. 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 Now, I will leave you with this verse or with this stanza from the song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. How deep the Father's love 
for us. How vast beyond all measure that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss the Father turns His face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Amen. Amen. To those who have not yet accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm pleading to you to come without delay. Come forward. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. If there are still gray areas that you don't understand about your faith, about salvation, you know, don't be shy. Approach me, approach one of the elders, our deacons, to help you and let us reason out together for the glory of God. And, uh, you know, Jesus Christ came for you. He loved you so much. He threw in a fist for you just for you. Okay. Again, repent and be baptized for the remissions of your, your, your sins. The gospel is yours, my dear brothers and sisters and friends, and shall we all stand as we sing the song of invitation. <laughs>